Viktor Frankl said, Everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of the human freedoms. To choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's way. This is Finding Human with Sue Jackson. Stay tuned for the next hour as Sue explores the human psyche, what makes us tick and how to live better, more fulfilled and more meaningful lives. Only on 101.9 High FM. Hello, this is Sue Jackson on the Finding Human program and my topic today is Tangled. But I couldn't help thinking that the, the a song that Craig has just been played, playing fits in very well with this when it says you've got to keep your head up and that we're all in this together. Um, this topic, Tangled, came about because of my little grandchild, Amitai, who's three years old and they were staying here from Israel. And I have those old types of phones, you know, those not the ones that you dial that were round, but the ones that you push button. And the mouthpiece is attached to a strong cord. And um, I have three of them, which I keep in a drawer. And my the grandkids have always loved playing with them. Anyway, one day uh, last week, my grandson brought the three of the phones to me and handed them to me. And he said, they're very tangled. And oh boy, were they ever. And it got me thinking, as I was unraveling these photo, these phone wires, I thought how appropriate that word was for the world that we are living in at the moment. I mean, after all, the African continent, the USA, Middle East, Russia, Ukraine, everywhere there are problems at the moment. And what a tangled mess our globe is in. And this is the story of life. And then I came across this saying by Dr. Clarissa uh, Pincola Estes from her book, uh, Women Who Run With the Wolves. And it says, ours is not the task of fixing the entire world at once, but of stretching out to mend the part of the world that is within our reach. And how true that is. So as I was untangling, that uh, those phones, I, I thought about how often in, in our lives we are frightened. And then I remembered a story that someone had told me about, uh, it was a story of a tapestry. And if you look at the back of a tapestry, all you see are knots that make no sense. They are knots, there's bits of uh, different color strings all cut off and it makes no sense at all and it's only when you turn it around that the picture is presented and in all its perfection and so it is in our lives so often we are the knots and the pieces of thread that are making up the tapestry of our lives and we have to go on until we do reach, I can't say perfection, but we do be become something of a picture of what our lives can be and what we want it to be. And as I thought about this tangled, I also thought about spider webs. And I don't know if you've ever watched a spider making its web. In our family, we do not kill spiders. Well, when I say that, I can't say that for one of my daughters who I used to go into her bedroom in the morning and I would find these cups, paper cups, turned upside down. And when I lifted them up, there were some bugs or or poor spiders trapped under these cups. Uh, she couldn't handle them, and I used to then have to get them and take them outside if they were still alive. But if you're watching a spider spinning its web, you'll notice that there are times when it free falls and you think, uh-oh, it's about to fall on the ground. But in actual fact, it doesn't. It joins up with another th thread or it spins around until it is connected to a thread, um, which is incredibly clever. And I think that's what we are being asked to do at the moment is to, we are in free fall at times, but as we feel this free fall, we have to learn to spin around, to 
find our footsteps somewhere else. And just as the spider's web continues, so our lives continued. And there are many ups and downs of our lives. And um, we, we need to have self-compassion in this time and realize that we are doing the best we can. Um, I was thinking also of people who have influenced my life because of their attitude. And the one person that came to my mind, and uh, I should imagine maybe some of her family are listening today, is Dora Seif. She turned 101 this month, and she she is absolutely amazing. And it's not as though I know Dora very well, and yet she has had such a profound effect on my life because of her wisdom and her attitude. I saw her a while ago coming out of a shop at, at Woolworths, and she, she told me that she couldn't hear too well, but she was so she just showed such joy in seeing me, and I felt that joy coming from her and emanating from her. And I thought if I ever reach that age, I hope I'm able to touch people's lives like she has touched so many lives. And then I thought about another friend of mine who was 21 years older than me, Daphne Worrell, who passed away a few years ago. And um, she also, we, she and I worked together uh, at, the, uh, at the New Gen Hospital in Johannesburg. And we laughed together. We cried together. We shared so much that it was just such an honest relationship that we had. And even when she left Johannesburg and went to go and live down at the coast, we still kept in contact and could talk for hours on the phone when we actually had that, that a chance to do so. So let us be the person that does stand up and show other people how to to live, how to show appreciation and gratitude and happiness and make other people realize that they are special too. Um, yesterday, I, I had a very uh, unsettled day for myself. And um, it's not often that I actually admit to it. And a friend of mine happened to say to me, you know, every time your daughter leaves to go back to Israel, you get sick. And it got me thinking, and I thought to myself, good heavens, is that what I do when I actually try to push my emotions down? Do I then get flu or lose my voice? Normally, it's my voice that goes. And so yesterday, I decided, all right, no, I am feeling sad. My daughter and her two children had left the night before to go to, to Israel and I was worried. I didn't sleep, nor did my husband the whole night, worrying until she reached um, Alice Ababa. And then from there, waiting for her to get another uh, flight to Israel. And uh, a young woman traveling with young children today, especially uh, with what's going on in the world, is, is, not, uh, is very unsettling. And while she is incredibly courageous in, in doing so, we have to show that we, we believe in her as well. But I must admit, it does take its toll. And yesterday was one of those days. And I, I felt like crying a lot of the time. And then also uh, I thought of this other uh, um, quote by Clarissa, Pincola Estes in her book, and it says one of the most calming and powerful actions you can do to intervene in a stormy world is to stand up and show your soul. Now, show your soul is not necessary to show your that you're not feeling. It's not necessary to pretend that we're okay when we're not. Showing your soul, your soul is to be authentic, authentic to yourself, that if we're being questioned by life, how are we answering to life? Who are we? Who do we want to be? And how do we want to express what we're feeling and not go into illness, to actually feel what what is going on? And um, yesterday, because I was feeling like this, I had two very uh, incredible um, encounters that did change my day to a certain extent. 
And the one was um, I was driving down a, a major road in Johannesburg. Some of you who live in Johannesburg and South Africa will know it's called the Jan Smuts Avenue. And if any of you have got anything to say about it, please WhatsApp me on, um, I'll give you the WhatsApp number in a minute. But so I was tra tra traveling down the Jan Smuts Avenue and the robots were out and uh, a taxi behind me started hooting and hooting and there was no ways I could actually go at that stage. So I, I just ignored him and thought, you know, to hell with you. And so he passed by me, he, he overtook me and shot back, he got shot into the traffic and how he managed to get through it, I don't know. But um, at the next stop street that we came to, he drew, drew up beside me. And we'll get back to that shortly. This is Finding Human with Sue Jackson, only on 101.9 High FM. This is Sue Jackson on the Finding Human program. And my, my topic today is called Tangled. I'm telling you about a story about taxis um, uh, going down a major road in, in Johannesburg called Jan Smuts Avenue and driving down. The robots were out, our, our, our stop streets were out and um, our stop, stop lights, traffic lights. And this taxi overtook me hooting and shot off into the traffic. Anyway, uh, the next, at the next uh, stop uh, street, this taxi drew up next to me and he started indicating, his passenger started indicating for me to put my, my um, window down. And I thought, no, no ways was I putting my window down for him. Anyway, he then made a, a, a heart uh, sort of, um, he put his hand to his heart and asking me to please put my window down. So um, I put my window down. And it was to be a very amusing um, encounter, this, because he said he leaned forward um, uh, in front of his passenger and he said, I just wanted to say thanks for letting me go. He said, uh, I, was, I was impatient, and, uh, but you, you actually, you saved me by not stopping me or going in front of me. So I said to him, well, you were jolly lucky because quite honestly, right now I'm in a bad mood and I almost stopped you from going. So he said, well, you didn't, and, and I just went. So I wanted to say to you, I'm sorry, I was rude. Well, I started to laugh. I think I was so surprised by his reaction that I started to, to laugh. And as I began to laugh, so he started to laugh as well. And as he drove off, he waved like anything. And all the passengers in his taxi were laughing and waving goodbye. And as I was laughing and waving goodbye as well. And I thought to myself, you know, uh, it's quite amazing how some things that you think are really negative, And I was very fed up. I really, because he was putting people's lives at risk. But um, how it, this, my anger was turned to a bit of humour. And, uh, and I thought to myself, you know, even though I was feeling that sad and tearful and tired yesterday, this happened. And I, I thought of John Denver's song, Some Days Are Diamond, Some Days Are Stone. Sometimes a hard time won't leave you alone. And I thought, well, there we are. Um, it's there's the danger is in becoming what I thought the day was, which was a negative day, and um, and then another thing happened. I, I happened to go to a to see a, a I had to go and see a, a doctor about something, and as I was coming out, a woman on crutches dropped a whole pile of, of papers. And uh, so, and I could see very definitely that she couldn't pick them up. So I said to her, don't worry, I'll pick them up for you, which is what I did. 
And as I did so, uh, I actually laughed. She said, oh, I can't thank you enough. I said, actually, I think I need to thank you. I said, I've had my knee replacement done. And I'm amazed at myself that I'm able to bend over and pick up all these papers. So you've done me a favor. So she told me that she had had many. She was on crutches because of uh, hip replacements. And she'd had this many hip, hip replacements and what have you. And I said to her, well, you know what, you, you have a very beautiful face. She really did. She had a very serene-looking face. I said, well, you have a very beautiful face, so the pain you're in is not showing on your face. And she said to me, well, do you know what this is? I said, no, I'd like to know. And she said to me, it is resilience. And, I, wow, I was bowled over by this thought of this lady who was in such unbelievable pain and here she was being able to say that it, her face looked so peaceful because of resilience now I'm just wondering I do have an audio clip and I'm wondering if Craig could play that for me Hi, I'm Dr. Bernie Siegel and I'm not a normal doctor the lines that literally transformed me and I wish I could find this woman she had breast cancer, a young woman, one of my patients. She sat next to me. She said, Bernie, you're a nice guy. I feel better when I'm in the office with you, but I can't take you home with me. So I need to know how to live between office visits. I learned that if you help people to live, wonderful things happen. They didn't die when they were supposed to. And then you begin to see it scientific, you know, to feel good about your life. And how people, when they transform their life, whether you call it rebirthing, born again, or anything else, um, and, and they began to enjoy the life they were living, uh, some miraculous things also happened. You know, as Solzhenitsyn said, self-induced healing occurred. When I finally wrote a book, when somebody said to me, do you ever think of writing a book? I thought, yeah, it saved me running around talking so much. That also changed my life. And that's a big part of where eventually I did leave surgery because the audience was changing. As healthcare professionals began to listen, I had a chance to change, you know, the care of more patients than if I stayed in my office. You know, it's again like talking to a hundred medical students, if I can change their attitude, think of all the people who will be helped versus if I sat in my office instead of talking to them. Many years ago, the American Holistic Medical Association started. We were all, you know, they're a bunch of quacks doing crazy things. But, you know, the people who joined were not. They were doctors who saw that there was more to healing, you know, really the whole picture, not just here's a prescription, here's a pill, have an operation, um, but let's look at the whole picture. So everything was brought in and that's what made it holistic. Watkins Books, a, a store in London, uh, did a survey of living spiritual healers, the top 100 in the world today. And I was number 20 in a year or so ago. Uh, that was quite a pleasant shock to me to realize that in the entire world, I was 20th on the list. Um, and uh, so you realize how the ripples go out. One of my meditations, I asked from nature that has all the answers, how can I travel less and still help people? And the message was, look what a flower does. It spreads its seeds. It doesn't go anywhere. It spreads its seeds. So let me help you learn how to deal with the difficulties. What does that do? It gives your body a message that can induce healing. And I love the term self-induced healing. It's not about spontaneity and miracles. It's about self-induced. So give your body the message. It's all scientific. Your genes don't decide. They get a message and then they perform. So give them live messages and let me and my channel help you to find that way. This is Finding Human with Sue Jackson, only on 101.9 High FM. 
Hello, this is Sue Jackson on the Finding Human program, and you've just listened to an audio clip by Bernie Siegel on his life story. Bernie is now 91 years old, and if you've read his book, uh, you'll know who he is. His book is called Love, uh, Medicine and Miracles, and he talks about self-induced healing. Having been in the healing profession myself for so many years, I I have to agree with him. And and healing is not always in the the medical sense. So it doesn't mean to say that you're you're healed physically, but often it's healing mentally. And people healing mentally have always been an absolute inspiration to me. Their bodies might be giving in, but they themselves never give in. And, And I found that, so amazing you know Charlie Harari who's an American motivational speaker he's an orthodox Jew he's a radio host and he's actually a clinical professor professor of um, just trying to think management and entrepreneurship uh, association um, uh, an associate professor, professor of management and entrepreneurship entrepreneurship he's amazing and he talks about the hero's moment and he says what is the hero's moment he says there comes a time when something happens and everything goes wrong and everybody quits but there's always one soldier that never gives up there's always one soldier that when all reasonableness says stop he says i'm never giving up and that is the hero moment and he says that we Jews are a nation that is built off the backs of a few heroes in every generation. And as uh, Israel is going through this incredibly, incredibly difficult time, um, I think this is something we need to remember. And he goes on to say, it's when a whole nation stands at the bank of a river and says, how am I going into the river? What am I even doing here? And one Jew, Nachshon, says, I am never giving up. It's when the whole nation stands at the edge of Canaan and they say, we can't go in, we can't fight. And one Jew, Caleb, says, we will go up and we will conquer it. It's one Jew, David, who stands up to Goliath. In every generation, there are those few Jews that when the going gets tough, they never give up. They say, I don't care if it gets hard. I'm going to do whatever it takes because only when it's tough do I become a hero. And that was Charlie Harari's story of what is the hero's moment. And it reminded me of the little story, a story I so often tell of the little sparrow who's lying on his back with his little legs stuck up towards the sky. And All the inhabitants in the world are rushing past it in panic and shouting, run, run, the sky is falling down. The sky is falling down. Run for your life. And the little sparrow answers, you run while I hold up the sky. At this moment in time, we actually all have the responsibility of not giving in to panic fear, negativity. We are all all being tasked with holding up the sky for each other. Today, news came through of hostages, bodies that have been recovered and have come through. And so often in this tangled mess of what is happening in the Middle East, we hear these terribly sad stories. And my heart is... I feel great empathy for what's happening in Gaza. I really do. But I also feel I cannot even begin to imagine the pain that the hostage families must be in. And every time that bodies are retrieved, uh, you know, how, how they must be feeling. And today the six bodies were found, and it's 318 days now that the hostages have been in captivity. And this brings me to a story I wanted to tell you of the yellow ribbon. 
And I know that many people in Johannesburg, certainly, and, and in Israel, and many parts of the world are wearing yellow ribbons at the moment, or have got, I've got them tied on my handbags, on my key rings. I've got a bracelet that says, a yellow bracelet that says, bring them home. And I've got the little uh, uh, pin that goes onto my lapel as well. And many of you do have that, I know. And I thought, let me just look up about where this this came from. And I was very, it was very interesting. Uh, the the origin of the yellow ribbon came from the response in 1979 when 52 Americans in the U.S. Embassy in Tehran were taken hostage by Iranian students. Everyone from the most junior staff members to the person in charge of the embassy were taken and they were held in captivity for 444 days. Closely following the crisis for over a year, the public wanted to show their support for the hostages and their families, and the yellow ribbons became the symbol of hope for their safe return. Um, the, the, it became a symbol of national support, and Bruce Langer, a State Department's uh, Foreign Service uh, person who was uh, uh, in, in charge of affairs of the U.S. Embassy in Tehran, um, he was given the role as a person in charge of the embassy to come to came to be seen as the informal um, as the informal leader of the hostages even after their release, and his wife, uh, what was her name, uh, Penny. Uh, it's called, it's, it's spelled P-E-N-N-E, -N -N -E, might be Penn, Langdon, also took on a leadership role and she was heavily involved in supporting and organising the families of the hostages. Now, we can all understand that at the moment because I think around the world, all the Jewish communities and other communities, thank you to all the other communities who are not Jewish, who have taken on uh, the the the, the um, will to free our hostages. And in an interview with the, this, this Penny uh, during the crisis, a reporter was shocked by her very calm demeanor, expecting her to be outwardly very angry towards Iran and the Iranians. However, instead of demonstrating violence and anger, she recalled in an, uh, uh, in an oral history, she was asked what Americans should do instead. And she said, Tell them to do something constructive because we need a great deal of patience. Just tell them to tie a yellow ribbon around the old oak tree. And the yellow ribbon, of course, refers to this, uh, the song Tie a Yellow Ribbon Around the old, old Oak Tree, which was written in 1972 um, and became a, a, a hit. So that's where the yellow ribbon actually started. So I wanted to know, and I was looking up, why, what, how did we come in Israel to look for this uh, yellow ribbon? And um, during in, in America, during the four months that the hostages were held um, by the Iranian students, um, they... The, the, these yellow ribbons were tied everywhere, and people were were tying them around their wrists, and it was it was that it became a national phenomenon. This yellow ribbon even appeared prominently at the Super Bowl, and uh, which I think was quite amazing. There was a huge, big um, uh, ribbon adorned the Superdome, so uh, <laughs> in New Orleans. So that's where that came from. So I wondered where our yellow ribbon came from. And I found this to be quite interesting. Uh, in the industrial designer Shaul, Shaul Cohen um, had, offer, had been creating whimsical products, it says, in his 3D design studio. And, I mean, he had even made inflatable berets for soldiers to use as a pillow on long bus drives, rides. Uh, and um, soon after, soon after October the seventh, when Hamas terrorists attacked Israel and killed um, so um, um, more than one thousand two hundred and abducted two hundred and fifty three hostages to Gaza, Cohen began three D printing thousands of small yellow ribbon pins intended to be a symbol of identification with those held in captivity. 
I'm going to get back to that story because it's interesting shortly. This is Finding Human with Sue Jackson, only on 101.9 High FM. Hello, this is Sue Jackson on the Finding Human program. My topic today is Tangled and the time is going very quickly. If you'd like to send me any messages, please do so on 061-895-1019. Craig is now going to be playing an audio clip for me, which is, it's called What is Being Heliotropic? And it's by Harry Cohen, the psychiatrist. Thank you, Craig. What do heliotropic people do? So they studied these people, and what they studied is these heliotropic people, these what they call positive energizers, do a bunch of behaviors, do a bunch of behaviors. They behave in ways that make other people feel great when they're around them. What do they do? Well, they're compassionate, they're kind, they're thoughtful, they're caring, they're patient and courageous and humble and they keep their word and they smile. Okay, these are all virtues that all of us love when we're around people who behave like this, but we like ourselves when we behave like this. So that's what it takes to be heliotropic. It's basically being a good person, being a caring person, a kind person, a compassionate person, a thoughtful person. It's being our best self, okay? And when we are, it feels great to be around us, just like we feel great when we're around people who are behaving like this. It's like sun on the leaves of a plant. It makes the plant feel great. Conversely, when we're around people who are negative, cynical, hostile, nasty, unkind, and lacking in compassion, and don't keep their word, and are frowning and cynical, it's like salt on their roots. It causes us and people to cringe. It's depleting. So what it means to be heliotropic is to be positive, uplifting, kind, thoughtful, courageous, humble, patient, all of the virtues that we love. But just do it with deliberate intent so that you know the effect on others is uplifting. That's what it means to be a positive energizer and to be heliotropic. It means to practice and emulate the qualities that we love in others. It's us at our best. This is Finding Human with Sue Jackson, only on 101.9 High FM. Hello, this is Sue Jackson on the Finding Human program. And um, my topic today is Tangled. And I was telling you about the yellow ribbons, which I guess can also be Tangled. But you just heard um, Harry Cohn speaking about um, be the sun and not the salt. And I'll get back to that shortly. But I just wanted to finish about the yellow ribbons. So he, um, Cohen began uh, 3D printing a few of these uh, ribbons. And uh, because he saw a, a yellow ribbon tied to a car's side view, and he watched yellow ribbons proliferate around Tel Aviv to voice solidarity you know, for the hostages. And uh, he realized that they'd long been a, a global symbol of tr- support for troops and expression of hope for their safe return. So he printed a miniature version of the ribbon, ribbon and superglued it to a pin he had that was sitting in the studio. And his colleagues in the studio wanted their own, so they printed a few more and then pictures put posted pictures on Instagram, which led to many other people wanting yellow ribbons as well. And he said he had 300 pins sitting in his studio and they were just sitting there. So he thought, OK, I'll print in what I have and glue them and people can come to the studio and just take them. Well, within a couple of days, all the ribbons have been printed, glued and handed out. And he was being asked to print more and more and more prints. Prints. Eventually, um, you can go on reading his story. It's called Designer 3D Prints, Tens of Thousands of Yellow Ribbon Pins for Hostages. Let's hope that all the yellow uh, ribbons that we have tied around trees, around bags, around our homes and our wrists, that our hostages are returned safely and they realize that we have been waiting for them and showing these symbols of support. Uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson said, the purpose of life is not to be happy. It is to be useful, to be honorable, to be compassionate, to have it make some difference that you have lived and lived 
well. Now, as far as not to be happy is concerned, I, I don't agree completely with R Ralph Waldo Emerson because I think happiness is, is a part of our lives and we need to embrace that part. What makes us feel happy? What makes us um, want to laugh out loud? And we need to... to or be authentic. Being authentic is to be uh, forgiving, compassionate, grateful, vulnerable, kind, real, all of those things that, uh, that um, uh, being the sun and not the salt actually is, that authenticity. But it's also in being able to laugh, to being able to 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 have fun. And um, we walked into a shop the other day, my, my daughter and I, and really this was brought home to me so, uh, to both of us actually, the negativity that people can spread. Because we walked into the shop and quite honestly, as we walked in, we could feel there was animosity towards us. And it's not often that I feel that, but we definitely did. Maybe it was uh, both of us had head coverings on and um, maybe it was the yellow ribbon. I don't know. But um, we said hello to some of the people who were standing around. They barely greeted us and certainly no one came to ask us if they could help us. And uh, we walked out and we went into another shop and there they were incredibly uh, helpful. So our intentions are contagious. How do we make people feel? Your energy that you put out says to people, keep out, keep away. Or it says, say hello. And uh, Mark Twain said, kindness is the language the blind can see and the deaf can hear. And I love that because I think that's very, very important to remember that our energy that we put out um, and in kindness is the language that the blind can see and the deaf can hear. And we have a responsibility or every step of our lives, actually, and every generation has uh, a time that they are questioned uh, about life. Um, and we can evolve or we can remain. We are, we are actually right now, we are being presented with choices, how to evolve or to remain stuck, unchanged and, um, and angry. Or we can change, we can make, we can choose to evolve. We can choose to love, to be loved, to be happy. Uh, this uh, saying by Elie Wiesel was very true for me. It says, as a Jew, I need Israel more precisely. I can live as a Jew outside Israel, but not without Israel. So right now, my story of, this, of being tangled is also of being in this web, a web that can be very healing because it connects us to one another. It connects us across continents and I've told the story before of my little grandchild in in uh, um, in Israel and how she told me about um, the 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 threads that bind us thank you Craig this is finding human with Sue Jackson only on 101.9 high FM Hello, this is Sue Jackson on the Finding Human program, and we, uh, we're going towards the end of the program, but I just wanted to tell you, because I'd started, about my little granddaughter in, uh, in Israel, and she, just, uh, she told me last time about the threads that bind us, and I said, what did she mean? So she said, well, all she has to do is pull the thread of the color of the person who is, is attached to the end of the thread. So I said, what do you mean? So she said, well, um, uh, Caroline and Normie and Mishy and Lee and Mark, Marky, they've all got threads. And she mentioned all her cousins. And you and Zayda have also got threads. And she said, and when I want to, you to think of me, I pull the thread and it touches your heart. So uh, it really moved me, the thought of this thread. And I asked her what what. Uh, color I was and she said my thread was purple and for those who know me they know I love purple so you know what every time I wear purple I think of this little girl and I think of the threads that do bind us 
And um, right now, we need to also laugh. And my little grandson, Amitai, said the other day, he sneezed and he said, I made a bless you. And the bless you is is so beautiful. Um, and in in our homes, we need to bring in laughter, uh, forgiveness, great uh, gratitude. It's all contagious, and we are living in a diff- difficult time. But we we can be the sun and not the salt, and we we need to realize that we all l- leave this glow behind us, and the glow can either be a glow of of darkness well then it's not a glow is it uh, it might be darkness or we could be the glow in the light um tonight I, I would suggest that you go out and you look at this beautiful moon uh, it's called i think it's called the sturgeon moon peter bailey sent me a, a thing on google on it thank you peter and last night we went out and uh, my husband leon and i went out to go and look at the moon it is exquisite look at the moon and you feel Wow, there's something so much greater than us, and uh, and let's just live our best lives. Let's make a difference to people's lives, and let's be the sun and not the salt. It's not. Uh, uh, it's we, we need to see each other, and we need to really recognize that we are all in this together. Um, I'd like to end by these words by Nelson Mandela. It is easy to break down and destroy. The heroes are those who make peace and build. I wish you safety and I wish you blessings. Thank you so much. Thank you, Craig. Thank you, Vusi. Thank you, Makundi.